And uh, I was just saying that um, this is actually a, a better bet anyways, because we're in the midst of getting ready for our new core exhibition that's being installed um, in the middle of our center right at the moment. And so everything is in boxes. Um, and there's almost no books to be seen outside of the gift shop. So um, you'll see more books in the virtual presentation tonight um, than you would if you were actually in the center right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, and uh, there's a few videos I'm gonna show you. And I'm hoping that you know, everything works out technologically on my end, but if not, we'll improvise. <laughs> Okay, can everyone see the goat? Thumbs up, fabulous, excellent, excellent. All right, so welcome to the Yiddish Book Center. We're so glad that you're uh, taking a tour with us this evening. Um, and I'm really happy to um, give you some background info um, about how we were founded, what we're up to these days and, uh, and, what, uh, and what the future of Yiddish looks like on our end, what kind of programs we're holding. So this, during the terrible wildfire smoke we have right now, um, what, the, what the campus looks like where the Yiddish Book Center is located. Um, so we're on the, the corner of Hampshire College, which is one of the five colleges in Western Massachusetts. Um, so it's kind of, we call it the five colleges area. Has anyone ever been to the Yiddish Book Center? <laughs> Besides Debbie? Um, I can't see you all, so if you do have something to say, please go ahead and unmute yourself and, and shout it out because um, I'm very interested in what, what you all have to say. Um, and anytime you have questions, um, just feel free to, to jump in. We are uh, an interesting, we're sort of perched in an interesting location on the foothills of the Holyoke mountain range. You can see it here. Um, and uh, when the Yiddish Book Center was, was founded, and we'll see more if, in a few minutes in the video, uh, it was founded by a man called Aaron Lansky. Um, and he was actually an alum of Hampshire College. He was a native of, of Massachusetts. And, uh, and so he was able to um, talk to the Hampshire College folks and, and actually buy 10 acres of apple orchard. So we're located in a kind of ridiculously idyllic location uh, surrounded by apple trees. Um, and we have a gorgeous like landscaped garden with a little pond. Um, and uh, it's just, it's just spectacular. I know Debbie was there in the, in the January. So you got the, <laughs> the frosty version, um, but it's uh, it's really, it is a spectacular place and it's kind of a funny place for, for Yiddish to end up, um, yeah. but we're, we're very happy to be there. And um it's we, the area that we're in, we sort of call it the, the cultural village or the annex of Hampshire mm. College um, because Hampshire College wanted to attract some other institutions um, because they've got this huge piece of land um, in Amherst or just outside of Amherst. Um, and so the other museum or cultural institution that's right next door to us is the Eric Carl Museum of Picture Book Art, which is a lovely place to take kids um, and it has gorgeous exhibitions and we occasionally do you get to do some cross programming, but not as often as I'd like. So come for the Yiddish books and stay for the children's book art. Um, there's the architecture of the Yiddish Book Center, as you'll notice right off the bat, is pretty unusual. There's almost no buildings that look like this anywhere in North America and few in Europe either. And um, that's because the architect that was hired to design the Yiddish Book Center, a man called Alan Moore, um, was very interested in researching the vernacular styles of Jewish from Eastern Europe, um, because that's what he does. He likes to immerse himself in these different styles of architecture. Um, so I think around the time that he had designed the Yiddish Book Center in the early 90s, um, he had just come from designing a center of reconciliation in Rwanda. So he really um, believes in sort of using the, the language and the cultures of the peoples um, to develop the, the place and the space. And that's evident when you look at the building. So it's designed to look like a shtetl, which is the name for a small 
predominantly a Jewish town in Eastern Europe. And so if you're looking straight on the Yiddish Book Center, the, um, the building with the little top to it is meant to be like a synagogue. And then these are meant to be all the other buildings and surrounding it. So um, we're in a culture village and our building is meant to resemble an Eastern European Jewish village. And this building was opened to the public in 1997. Um, and then we grew so much that they added uh, an additional section, um, but they didn't want the, the sort of original footprint of the building uh, to be altered. So I work in the basement. <laughs> they just went, they just went underneath. Um, so we have cubicles in the basement that uh, are not as, as unique as the rest of the buildings. Um, but what's fascinating is that this style of architecture um, which existed across Eastern Europe um, and was predominantly destroyed in the Holocaust. Um, but if you go ever, if you have the opportunity to go to the Museum of um, Polish Jews in Warsaw, they recreated a number of these buildings um, in a three quarter model size. Um, and you can go and, and um, experience sort of an immersive history and culture of this architecture in Warsaw. So if you walk in the front door, you see all these individual buildings that are clustered together. And it's actually kind of a, a trick of the eye because once you go inside, you'll see that it's all one big open space. So that was very intentional for the architecture that it looks sort of clustered together like communal on the outside and then inside it's just huge, airy, open with skylights. So you can always, uh, if I wanna know what the weather is like, I go up from the basement and Look at the skylights and look at all the the beautiful views from all of these windows on the main floor. So as I mentioned, the Yiddish Book Center was founded by a man called Aaron Lansky. Um, and if you're interested in finding out more after our talk tonight, you can read his book. It's called Outwitting History, The Amazing Adventures of a Man Who Rescue, Rescued a Million Yiddish Books. And it's a, it's a really fun and, and moving story about his, his journey towards finding a million Yiddish books and rescuing them and putting them in the book center. Has anyone read the book? Uh, Karen, Benjamin, did you want to unmute yourself and, and say something? Yeah, I saw a YouTube video on him that talked about when he was collecting all the books and how when he would go to this these different places, he would meet with the people and they wouldn't just say, here are all the books. They would say, and the stories behind like every single book. And then they'd say, now you need to go next door or upstairs. And it was the same thing again and again. <laughs> exactly. We're going to watch that video in a, in a minute. Um, so thank you for introducing the topic because it's really, <laughs> um, it's really profound that, you know, when you donate a book, it's not just the book, it's the person who owned the book, it's the community the book lived in, um, it's the entire history of, of the Jewish people through objects. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So if I can get my technology to work, let me uh, play the movie for you. Yiddish was a spoken language of roughly three quarters of the world's Jews for the past thousand years. Books were our portable homeland. Books define our national identity. We call ourselves Am HaSefir, the people of the book. And yet, here were books being destroyed. When I first came up with this idea to go rescue the world's Yiddish books, the response everywhere was essentially the same. Don't you know Yiddish is dead? Don't you know no one cares about this culture any longer? Why don't we give you a nice scholarship and you can go off and study in Israel? Why do you have to waste your time with these old books that nobody wants? In those days, they said that, well, all of Yiddish literature was out of print. 
If you wanted to find an out-of-print Yiddish book, you could go to an obscure book dealer in Amsterdam, or else you might find it in a garbage can in Brooklyn, and there wasn't too much in between. First of all, you have to understand, I was 23 years old when all this uh, came about. I was studying Yiddish literature. Probably would have gone on to a very conventional academic career were it not for this one very basic problem. There were no books to read. Each week, our professor would assign us, oh, I don't know, a novel by any of dozens of major Yiddish writers. So right after class, one of us would race off and be the first one to get to the Jewish public library and find a copy of the book. But for the rest of us, there were no books to be had. So I started putting up notices, you know, little signs on the Jewish delicatessen and the laundromat in the old Jewish neighborhood saying, I'm a young graduate student, I'm looking for Yiddish books. So before I knew it, people were calling up boxes of books are piled high, and my apartment is overflowing with piles and piles and piles of Yiddish books. And it was somewhere along that point, I got a phone call from my parents, and they said, Aaron, I think you have to come home because the rabbi's given us so many books, we're afraid the second story of the house is about to collapse. And I think it was just about that moment that the Yiddish Book Center was born. Well, I had no clue what the actual work of going around and collecting Yiddish books really entailed. Along with all these boxes of books came letters and postcards uh, from older Jews who would write and say, I have many books to give you, but I'm too old or I'm too infirm or there are just too many books. You're going to have to come and get them. So in mid-July of 1980, I set out on my very first collection trip. I had received a postcard which came from an elderly man, and I, I knew already how old he was because it was a penny postcard which came postage due. So he writes in this very scratchy handwriting, he said, I'm a very old man, I am leaving on a trip to Israel, I'm afraid that I might not return, and if I don't, I'm afraid they will throw away my books, will you please help me? I show up at noon, and in this tiny one-room apartment, all there was was a little small bed, there was a metal table with a hot plate and a million bottles of medicine. And other than that, the apartment was full of boxes and piles of both Yiddish and Hebrew books. Well, I figured, all right, you take the books, you put them on the hand truck, you roll them out to the truck, fire tick, and you move on to the next stop. Uh, it wasn't to be. He sat me down at the table, he says, oh, no, no, he says, young man, young man, which became sort of my generic name in the Yiddish world, he says, young man, he says, I first have to tell you about each of these books. He began handing me every one of these books, one volume at a time. He says, this book here, my wife and I, we bought in 1927. We went without lunch for a week. We should be able to afford it. And this book, have you read this book? Sit down right now, look at this book. It went on for hours and hours and hours. I'm so far behind schedule. At this point, I finally have his books in the truck. I'm about to drive off, and he says, and Manut Jungerman, he says, Vehin Leifste, where are you running to? I said, where am I running? I said, I have other stops to make. I'm already behind schedule, he says. Oh, he says, if I state in this, you don't understand, he said. And he explained that when he received my telegram, he told all the other people in the building that I was coming. And he said, they all have books for you. Let's get to work. I look up. It's like this 12-story high-rise building. I said, all the people have books. I said, that's right, they all have books. Let's start going. We walk into the building. He knocks on every door. People come up with shopping bags and boxes, suitcases even, full of books for me. And of course, what do you think you have to do at every single apartment? They bring you inside. They sit you down at the table. They make a glass of tea. They get the Entenmann cakes come out of the box and the Lux and Kiglach that have been waiting all day come out of the oven. And they feed me and they tell me the story of their books as well. Here I am, 23 years old, you know, in jeans and a t-shirt, but somehow it's fallen on me to try to pick up the fragments of this world and save them for the future. Because when people give you their books, it's a very candid moment in their lives. They're handing you the treasures they've accumulated in their lifetime, and they know their own children and their own grandchildren don't want. Invariably, they're crying. 
Uh, they tell stories with a candor that would probably be very rare in their lives. So it's a very special moment. There was a sort of emotional uh, understanding that that when people hand you their books, as they say to you, Yunga man, otis man Yerusha, here is my inheritance, this is what I am leaving to the world. What they're leaving to you is a world that is very fast vanishing. It was a world that was shattered in the Holocaust. It was a world that simply vanished under the pressures of assimilation. These were the people who themselves had created a new world. And it was a new world in which very few people were now interested. And so here we were, uh, they had so much to tell us. There was a sort of understanding that what was happening was a moment in history. I mean, I knew that from the very first trip, and I never forgot that, and I have not forgotten it 21 years later. Early on, it became apparent there was no way that a handful of young people were going to be able to, you know, round up thousands of what turned out to be hundreds of thousands of Yiddish books. So we organized a network of what we called Zamlers, or volunteer book collectors. The idea went way back to the early years of the 20th century, when Jewish historians of Eastern Europe had called for a network of these Zamlers, or volunteer collectors, to round up communal records. It's been an enormously emotional experience for us our encounters with the Zamlers over the years. For them, this was really, it was cultural preservation. It was saving their own lives and their own life stories. So they had a real urgency in what they were doing. I think the real question, though, is how come so many people care about dusty old Yiddish books they can't read in the first place? When... Uh, my mother's mother came to America. She was carrying with her a valise in which she had everything she had brought with her from the old country. Her older brother met her and took the suitcase and he flung it overboard. Her photographs of her parents, her clothing, uh, her Shabbos candlesticks, everything she had with her was thrown out. He understood that the price of admission to America was to throw the old country away. But I think for my generation, I am finally secure enough in my Americanism that I can now go back and I can dredge the harbor and I can find the suitcase that was thrown out. In the beginning, I was literally hitchhiking from city to city. Every time I would speak, Five people, 10 people, 15 people would sign up as members. So that today the Book Center is supported by over 30,000 members. They're one of the largest Jewish cultural organizations in the country. We have this wonderful building. It gives to Yiddish what we call in Yiddish an address, which in Yiddish means a little more than an address. It means it gives it a place in the world. I will never forget when I stood there that first night after we'd finally moved into the building. Yiddish had finally found a home. But the next challenge was how do you interpret that literature for the 99% of the visitors who can't read those books in the original? So we organized educational programs. We're doing exhibitions. And, of course, we have the core of books. We've augmented or established collections of Yiddish literature at 450 major university and research libraries in 26 countries around the world. And then in the summertime, we have groups of student interns who come. We teach them Yiddish in the morning, and they spend the rest of their day going through these boxes in unvarying 
treasures. Now that we don't have to worry about the physical preservation of the literature, we have a much bigger worry. Today the challenge is how do you open up the books and share the culture with a broader world? And for that, the work's just begun. Yeah, any reactions to the to the video? Feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. I know exactly what he talks about when he was getting the books from people that that's part of their lives because going through some of the books in my house and, and taking them to the library for you know, the book sales and things like that is like a piece of me. And there are some pieces of me that I just can't turn over, but yeah. I get that, you know, it's, um, you know, it's like the touch and the feel and the history and the stories and the relationships behind those books that make them live. So I thought that was, that really struck me when he said that about everyone. Well put. I agree. Yeah, it's books are more than just words on a page. There's so much to them that uh, we can never really truly be encompassed in, in other forms. Yeah. I'm going to jump in yeah. and mention, um, yeah, I've got some books from my grandparents. Um, but what really struck me was when he told us stuff. Uh, the story of his mother's mother, of his grandmother, and losing the pictures and everything that she had brought from the um, old country. Yeah. I am right now, my uncle passed away late last year, that he was the last of that generation, of my parents' generation, and I got the boxes. And I'm sorting through the pictures and and probably the ones that have touched me the most are the pictures that came from the old country. I found a picture of, I know this is my grandfather as an infant. Don't ask me how I know, but somehow I know that's him. And when he said that her, her stuff was thrown in the bay, it's like, no, you can't do that. Yeah, the the immensity of what's lost when you lose those kinds of pieces of material culture, photographs, tell us so much about the past. And yeah, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Anyone else want to share anything? So, um, yeah, so as you can see from, from Aaron's video that uh, the, the story of the book center um, is a story of, of Aaron and his immense organizational skills and of all of the Zomblers and collectors um, that we've had over the years who've collected um, over one and a half million volumes of Yiddish books and all the people who donated those books. And so it's really um, an ongoing conversation in a lot of ways um, between you know, the people who receive the books and the people who gave the books and the people who get the books next. It's, it's all kind of an interconnected web or, or network. And it's really, it's very special. Um, it's really a privilege to be able to be um, to be part of that. Of course, my role is is mainly is only in in terms of the education. I don't I don't get to unpack the boxes of books myself, um, but I I do get invited uh, to watch the unboxing when there's some exciting books that are that are brought in. 
which happens all the time, actually. Um, so since 1980, um, even though experts at the time said that there are probably only 70,000 individual volumes of Yiddish literature, um, we've collected over one and a half million individual volumes, and we still get 200 a week on average. And uh, during the pandemic, because there were a lot of people who were cleaning out a lot of different spaces in their in their families' um, homes, um, we averaged about 800 books a week. And uh, we still get um, major collections from scholars, from writers and activists, and you know people who had entire you know Yiddish libraries that they built up, you know hundreds and hundreds of volumes over many many decades. Um, and sometimes it's just, you know, two or three volumes um, from an individual who just wanted to make sure that they had somewhere to go. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll take them all. <laughs> um, but the nice thing is that even, you know, sometimes we get, you know, libraries are getting rid of their Yiddish book collection, so we'll take it. But then there's other libraries that want that Yiddish book collection. Um, so sometimes, particularly in North America, especially if it's, um, like a like a rabbinical school or seminary or um, some kind of educational institution. Sometimes a lot of synagogue libraries um, are getting rid of Yiddish books, um, and so we'll take those Yiddish books. But then, um, particularly in Poland, Jewish studies is really undergoing a renaissance in Poland right now. And so universities like Wrocław and Warsaw and Krakow and all over the place um, are acquiring actively acquiring Yiddish books for their own libraries because. They have new scholars of Yiddish literature and people are translating Yiddish literature into Polish and creating gorgeous new volumes um, of Yiddish literature. And so those books are, are quite precious to people over there. So it's, it's still an ongoing reciprocal relationship, which is very, very special. Um, so I should mention that besides the, the work of the books, which is the main work that we do, um, as Aaron mentioned in his video, it's all about also preparing future generations to understand those cultural treasures and what they represent. Um, so we just finished uh, our Yidstock, which is our music festival that happens every year. It's a good time to come. Um, and so we had hundreds of people that came from all over the place um, and enjoyed um, klezmer and Yiddish music. And uh, it's really, it's very, very, very special event to get. All, all kinds of different people in the building. Um, but summer is always our, our favorite time of year because um, for one thing, all the students from Hampshire College go home. And so we get to um, rent out the dorms ourselves. Um, and so we've had um, our college Yiddish summer program uh, for the last six weeks. This is their last week. So it's a seven week program uh, with college students across the country. It's fully funded um, thanks to generous donors. And so the students come and they spend seven weeks um, living in the Hampshire dorms and taking Yiddish classes all day long um, and learning about Yiddish dance and Yiddish art and Yiddish music and Yiddish puppetry. And um, we took them on a field trip to New York City. I did a little walking tour of the Lower East Side. So it's a very intense, very immersive Yiddish experience. And uh, the students come out at the other end speaking really good Yiddish. Um, so that's always an inspiring time of year to be amongst that, you know, learning. Um, and then next week we have our great uh, Jewish books program for teens. So high school students, uh, 36 of them apply, again, fully funded, thanks to generous donors, and spend a week. Um, and in Hampshire dorms, we have all these, uh, uh, you know, residents, assistants who come and, and help out. And then, uh, and then they take classes all day and they read. Um, not just Yiddish literature and translation, but all kinds of Jewish books. And um, then we get great teachers um, to come in and facilitate discussions. So that's um, another one of our, our favorite programs. Um, but we also have a translation fellowship. We offer Yiddish language classes, both in person and online. And we actually have an imprint now, White Goat Press. So people can come here and get a grant to work on a translation of a Yiddish novel, and then we can help them publish it with a, with a major press or we can publish it ourselves through White Goat Press. Um, and so the book you're reading next, the Chava Rosenfarb book um, is published by White Goat Press. So we're able to, to keep this sort of network and web of relationships going through translation um, and pedagogy and all kinds of things as well. So that's 
very exciting for all of us. Um, oh, Jen, yes. jump in. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to know why the goat. I don't understand that. And uh, second if question. You're here, oh, if you're here in I person, get... I give you a bookmark that says "Why the goat." It literally says "Why the goat." <laughs> <laughs> we have bookmarks at the front desk. Um, so there's a couple of different reasons. Um, I think that it is in you know in some ways because the um, historically and going back to the Bible, there's you know such a concept as a scapegoat. Um, and so it relates to, you know, Jews being a, you know, a receptacle for like other people's ideas. And so sort of claiming that identity um, proudly as like, as reclaiming the goat um, as a symbol of not, you know, victimhood, but of, you know, agency um, is one part of it. Um, and the other part is that goats uh, turn up pretty frequently in Yiddish folklore and literature. Um, just as a sort of a humble, scrappy figure, almost like the, you know, a Tevia type figure um, who, who's sort of um, always prevalent and, you know, in the, in the shuttle, in the shuttles, um, you know, goats are, um, if you can't afford a cow, you can probably still afford a goat. Um, and in the Yiddish uh, song from the Yiddish theater, uh, Raisins and Almonds, Rojan Kismit Mandlin, which some of you may have heard, um, the goat is a, is a sort of essential uh, figure and metaphor in that song as well. So yeah, there's not one reason why the goat, but it definitely, um, there's a lot of uh, factors can in confluence together to make the goat our, our symbol. And um, he's got a name, his name is Tsigi because the Yiddish word for goat is Tsigile. Um, and so our mascot is Tsigi the goat. Great question. Um, and we have our digital library. Um, so you can, if there's any Yiddish book that you're curious about that's actually, you know, written in Yiddish, um, you can find it either by typing in transliterated characters or in Yiddish characters on our website. And so we've got um, hundreds of thousands of Yiddish books that are available. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the literature itself will be um, preserved, even if God forbid something happened to the actual physical volumes, which as we know are incredibly important, but the literature will still be preserved. Um, and the, uh, the servers that we, um, that hold all of this information are part of this bunker complex um, that is actually inside a mountain that's part of the Holyoke mountain range that you can see from the Yiddish Book Center. So if you walk out into the Yiddish Writers Garden, you'll see a little plaque that says, uh, you're looking at this mountain that um, is actually hollowed out on the inside. And can anyone guess? This is not for Yiddish. This had a different purpose. Can anyone guess why there would be a secret hollowed out mountain in the middle of nowhere in Western Massachusetts? Oh, oh you're muted. Unmute. <laughs> I, I would guess a uh, bomb shelter. Yeah, um, Cold War, right? So yeah, it was it was for nuclear fallout. Um, it was like because there's an air force base nearby. I guess the idea was that it would be like the third or fourth place that people would go in the event of like a major nuclear attack, um, and uh, you know like the president could hide there or whatever. Um, so they have this space that only you know closed down for military purposes a decade or so ago, and now it's used for art storage by all of the five colleges, including the Yiddish Book Center. Um, we have books and, and servers there. Karen? Yeah, I have an, another question. Um, I wanted uh, to know the oldest book, but I also wanted to know, did you find when you were going through the, you said you had newspapers and things like that, that um, you saw a history that may not have been reported that um, that would kind of a different historical outlook on all the things that were happening to the Jews in Europe, Eastern Europe. Um, I mean, like, is there a different perspective on well, that? Just history? more in depth or how they managed to get all the books out and what, kind of dip because I find some of those stories just so revealing and dramatic and 
Yeah, um, I mean, that's true of um, all of the, you know, great Yiddish and Jewish libraries in North America. Um, I used to work at the YIVO Institute in New York and they have quite a story of part of their collection being hid, hidden in a basement um, and found only after the war. Um, and uh, now they're uniting those collections um, in Eastern Europe and, and in here digitally. Um, and yeah, for the, in terms of the Yiddish Book Center, I mean, there's, um, well, you'll see in a minute, I'll play another video of our vault um, because it's full of newspapers and journals and, um, and other sources of, and of, of information that really, that do um, augment, you know, the history book um, and movie sort of interpretations of, of Jewish life in Eastern Europe. So we can talk about that more in a minute as well. Let me skip ahead just because I don't want to run out of time entirely. Um, so this is um, what our, our vault looked like uh, before we did some reorganizing recently. Um, but um, so if you went through the building, uh, Debbie, did you go to the vault? Did you get a tour of the vault when you were there? Oh, yes, I did. It was very impressive. <laughs> okay, great. So um, if you walked into the vault, it would take a special key to go inside and you'd notice that the temperature is much, much colder. It's about 62 degrees there at any given point. And uh, the people who work there all day long actually wear like um, special like canvas suits that zip up because it can get very dusty in there. Um, just because, you know, there's just all these books that are <laughs> disintegrating little bits of paper into the atmosphere. Um, and so believe it or not, there's about a half a million books um next to my office down in the vault and uh, and then we have another half a million that are uh, located in various other storage facilities maybe including the cold war bunker um and uh, and so it's always a treat to take people into the vault um to to show them around and so these are last year's fellows emily and sarah and they're going to give you a brief tour of the vault hi everyone i'm sarah and i'm emily and we're the bibliography fellows we're so excited to show you around our rare books vault. Let's look inside. So now we're inside our rare books vault. This is where we keep our rare books, also our duplicate copies and some special non-book items. Um, we have about 250,000 books in here. And if we have enough copies, we sell them back out to readers and they're also available online. We keep this vault at about 62 degrees to protect the books. And um, we're so excited to show you around. Welcome to the rare book section of the book vault at the Yiddish Book Center. At the book center, we tend to try to keep at least three of each book that we get in. Anything above that, we can sell back to the public, get them back in circulation, back to readers. Um, but there are some books that we don't even have three copies of, and we may only have one copy. That's where the rare book section comes in. So this shelf and the shelf next to me make that section up and there are a couple ways that we usually determine if something is rare or that will tip us off if something is rare when we get books donated to us. The first thing that we look for is where it was published. If it was published somewhere like New York or like Warsaw where there were extremely like large prolific Yiddish publishing houses, it tends to not be as rare um, because they were published more in mass quantity as opposed to someplace like Berlin or Lodz or Chicago that had smaller short-lived comparatively short-lived Yiddish, public, like Yiddish publishing histories. The second thing is time period. If something is kind of before the 1900s or immediately post-war um, and published in Eastern Europe, those tend to be more rare. Um, we tend to not have as many copies of those. Uh, and then the last thing that we look at is genre. Um, there are books that are kind of like what we would think of as kind of like airport <laughs> pulp novels that uh, didn't, they were printed really cheaply, they weren't really meant to survive. Um, those tend to be rare just because they were they were printed on cheap paper that didn't make it. Things like cookbooks that were used really frequently and kind of battered tend to be rare because they didn't survive. Things that are printed expensively on the other end of the spectrum also can be rare um, because it was so expensive to print them, like really nice art books, really nice kind of illustrated pieces that they only printed small runs because of how expensive it was to print. So the first book from the rare section that I'm going to show you is called Herta Meise by Wolf Tambor. And this book was published in Bucharest in 1985, so it's a great example of a Yiddish press that was more small and short-lived, which makes his books um, a little bit rarer. And it just has a great graphic design, great cover, um, and is a great example of something we look for in a rare book. The second book that I'm going to show you is one of my personal favorites. Um, it's a copy of Gaucho's 
which is a book that was actually translated from Spanish into Yiddish. And if you look at the back cover, you can see the Spanish with the original author and translator. Um, and it's a really great example of books that were translated, um, of a book that was translated from another language. We have books from Spanish, from English, from Russian, from Polish. This one is specifically from Buenos Aires in 1925. I'd love to show you our typewriter collection. These typewriters were all used to type in Yiddish, but we'll talk about later how some of them were originally made to be Hebrew typewriters. Um, we have many different typewriters, some from published Yiddish authors donated by their children. For example, number 27, this is Bluma Lempel's typewriter. Number 38, this is Hannah Rosenkarp's typewriter. And then number 39, which was just donated, is Malka Haifetz Tristman's typewriter. These are fascinating examples of the modernization of Yiddish, and I like to think about different technological advancements and how that influenced Yiddish literature. For example, when typewriters became more portable, did that change what people wrote? Um, lots of questions to be had when looking at our Yiddish typewriters. Here we have two Brett typewriters, one owned by Hava Rosenfarb and one owned by Bluma Lempel. And these are a fascinating way to see the differences between the Hebrew and Yiddish languages. So Bluma Lempel's typewriter was made originally to be a Yiddish typewriter. And we see here that we have the double letters. We have double vav, sve vavin, and double yud, sve yudin. And that is because Yiddish uses this uh, double letter combination quite frequently. And it's very convenient when using a Yiddish typewriter to have these letters together. However, if you're typing with a Hebrew typewriter, you do not have those double letters provided and you would just have to type them twice when typing in Yiddish. We also see on this Yiddish typewriter that it has a stumer aleph, a silent aleph, and a comets aleph, the O sound, um, separately, which is quite convenient, again, when you're typing with Yiddish diacriticals. However, the Hebrew typewriter only has one aleph, and it doesn't have any of the diacritical marks that are often used in Yiddish. If you're typing with a Hebrew typewriter, you can either omit these diacritical marks or add them later, um, but it's quite handy to be able to type in Yiddish with a Yiddish typewriter. One of the other forms of literature that we have at the Yiddish Book Center are Yiddish journals. Um, this is the back wall of the vault where all of our Yiddish journals live. Uh, a Yiddish journal functioned kind of like a magazine where people would have subscriptions and they would get the journal monthly, weekly, annually. Um, it depended on the journal. They covered everything from politics to art to literature to health, um, health and wellness, um, and were a really important part of local Jewish communities um, and how they would engage with each other um, through literature and politics. Um, here you can see we have started the process of uh, reorganizing and cataloging all of our journals to hopefully be accessible to readers in the future who are interested in research or literature um, because they were often a great way for like newer writers or less known writers um, to be published without having to publish a whole book. This is an example of uh, a particularly important journal. It's from a DP camp, a displaced persons camp, um, after the Holocaust uh, in Germany. It's called From Lusten Korben, which means from uh, the last extermination. Uh, DP camp journals in particular were important um, in establishing some kind of Jewish autonomy in these DP camps after the Holocaust and after World War II that, uh, that told the Jewish community about things like the community theater and things like what's going on in the Jewish school and also served a political purpose in advocating for things like access to kosher food, access to a mikveh, um, the ability to determine their own forms of education and their own religious services um, within these kind of military run DP camps. Uh, <laughs> Hi everyone, here we are in the Yisker Bicher section. Yisker is a Yiddish word of Hebraic origin that has to do with remembering. Remembering, so these are memorial books that honor the memory of different Jewish towns, primarily in Eastern Europe. Um, and they are all here and they're all digitized on our website, which we did recently in collaboration with the National or with the New York Public Library. Here I have an example from um, Bialystok, 1982, which is later for Yisker books. Um, and you can see it's bilingual and on the inside as well. Um, and that's to say that this is the only genre we officially collect in every language. Um, we have some Yisker books in Hebrew and Polish and other languages, but primarily in Yiddish. And these are really fascinating examples of public history. They are mostly published by Landsmannschaft groups and other groups of people that were survivors and came together 
um, and each wrote different chapters and published this book by themselves. So they're written kind of by everyday people for everyday people. They're fascinating examples of life in Eastern Europe. There's often pictures and maps drawn by hand of people remembering their towns. Um, and there are also um, really incredible resources for genealogical research. Okay, so that is the end of our vault presentation. I'm just gonna skip ahead in my slides. I always include this little bit about the history of Yiddish, which we're not gonna have time for today, but you never know when we're gonna have technological difficulties. Uh, but I'll stop here because this is a really fun one. Um, so this is an example of how the Yiddish language is both completely, integrally its, its own language. It's a linguistically called a fusion language, not unlike English, um, borrowing from Romance and Anglo-Saxon and all those other um, languages. Um, but here you can see a really good example. This is, a, of course, an artificial sentence um, made up to, to demonstrate all the different uh, parts of Yiddish, but I think it's a really good example, which we use all the time in our tours. Um, so the sentence is, Ze Bubba macht a trollant of Shabbos. Now, without looking at the translation, um, does that sentence sound familiar or the words there that people recognize? Unmute yourself. Tell us. Shabbos. Shabbos. And so I um, the solent sounded a lot like Cholent. I Cholent. don't say it correctly, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Bobe um, is a is a Slavic word like babushka. So like it's very sounds like a Russian word. Um, macht, of course, sounds very much like a German word. Um, Shabbos is a word of Hebrew origin, which means the Sabbath. And uh, cholent is, of course, the best word here because um, it's a very, very distinct uh, Jewish dish. It's an Ashkenazi dish, although Sephardic makes sim Sephardic makes similar dishes to some other parts of the world. Um, they call it hamim or other things. But um, in Yiddish um, in Eastern European Jewish cuisine, it's um, a dish that follows the the restrictions of Shabbos of the Sabbath. So um, in order to have hot cooked food um, on the Sabbath, uh, what you would do is you would take a dish of really hearty foods like chopped um, vegetables, like root vegetables and barley and beef um, and a lot of different beans and maybe some eggs and you would um, cook it so that it was like 90% cooked before the Sabbath. And often in, in the shuttles, um, they would have a communal oven. So everyone would have their own family cholent dish that had their initials on it. And you would take it and bake it in the communal oven and then you'd come get it um, where it would be sitting at a, at a warm temperature overnight. And after a synagogue the next day, you'd come and, and pick up your cholent um, and, and take it back to your house for lunch. And um, so now you're getting the idea from, if you can hear the, the contraction in the words that it's actually what we'd recognize today is French, which show meaning hot and long meaning slow. So slow, hot cooked food on the Sabbath. So you can get a sense of, uh, of all the different ways that, that Yiddish uh, works both linguistically and, and culturally to be a distinct language and culture. Um, here's a picture of the first Yiddish newspaper, um, which was began publish, publishing in Russia um, in 1862, around the time that there were some, the Tsar of Russia lifted some restrictions on, uh, on publications of, of any kind. Um, and so there were Yiddish newspapers um, that published daily from 1862 through today. So today, most of the Yiddish newspapers that are uh, published are uh, for the Hasidic community, um, but there are daily newspapers, um, both published in New York and in Jerusalem still today. Um, at the height of uh, the immigrant period of Yiddish speakers in the United States, there were five Yiddish daily newspapers published in New York City. And this is an election poster from 1917, um, showing the, the Yiddish nationalist movements um, outside of Zionism that were um, what they called, you know, um, Bundist or Jewish nationalist or diaspora nationalist. Um, and so it says, um, you know, vote in the vote for the socialist Jewish socialist party in the coming election. And uh, this is our land. So that Yiddish was being claimed as a, as a language of the place where Jews lived. 
which um, made sense at the time because before the Holocaust, um, there were about 13 million Jews um, in Eastern Europe, and that was 90% of the world Jewish population. So what happened to Yiddish speakers during the Holocaust? Um, the majority of them were, were murdered or killed or met their deaths because of the Holocaust. Um, and as Emily mentioned in the vault tour, um, many of those who survived ended up in displaced persons camps, mostly in Germany, and, um, and immediately began um, reestablishing Yiddish culture um, through newspapers, through theater, through all kinds of civil societies and networks and immigrant organizations. Um, and one of the things I've noticed just from having studied Yiddish um, is there must have been quite a, a baby boom in the displaced persons camp because so many of my Yiddish teachers and just general people that I've met of, of my parents' generation were born in DP camps. Um, so there was really a, a motivation to, to to build and and to and to create, um, and a lot of the people who left the Dupi camps went to places like Montreal, which is where I learned Yiddish um, from someone who was born in a Dupi camp, and um, and they went to New York and they went to Melbourne, Australia has a huge population of Holocaust survivors, um, and Argentina, all over the world. So Yiddish was revitalized all over the world um, after the war. And of course, there are still people who speak Yiddish today, um, even outside of um, the Yiddish Book Center. Um, as I mentioned, there are still uh, daily newspapers published in Yiddish. Um, there are kids' books published in Yiddish. There are graphic novels published in Yiddish. There's um, spy novels published in Yiddish. And you can go to Brooklyn and go into a, a big Jewish bookstore and you'll find all of these things. So this population is Hasidic Jews. Um, and so there's not a lot of crossover between the publications that are used for their community and for the outside world, but um, it's, it's changing rapidly. Um, so for example, the this college students that just went on this um, Yiddish field trip uh, to New York who are here for the summer, um, they went to go visit uh, a woman who lives in the Satmar community, who's a very, very well-established member of the Satmar community, which is a very ultra-Orthodox Hasidic group. And her name is Rose Waldman. Um, and she is a very, very, very well-respected Yiddish translator. In fact, she's translating um, a novel by the Yiddish writer Chaim Grada, um, who's notoriously difficult to translate. Um, and so, you know, she welcomes Yiddish students into her home and she, and did an MFA at NYU and, you know, is very active in, in the translation world. Um, but she's, you know, she's in her 40s and she's a grandmother. Um, and she's, you know, a very well-respected member of her Hasidic community. Um, so there are ways to be both in the Hasidic world and to participate in the larger world, especially the Yiddish um, sort of, you know, language learning, translation, educational world. Um, so there's there's always connections. There's always always a small world. In Yiddish, they say Welt mit der Weltwach. And if you're interested in learning Yiddish or hearing Yiddish spoken, um, there is a podcast, a feminist Yiddish podcast called Vibertich, um, which is on hiatus right now. But it's a woman I went um, to grad school with called Sandy Fox. Um, she just published a really well received book on the history of Jewish summer camps in North America. And while she was writing her dissertation, she also um, produced this amazing uh, podcast um, where she just interviews all kinds of really interesting people um, all in Yiddish. The whole podcast is in Yiddish. And a lot of it is people um, like Sandy and myself who learned Yiddish um, in college or grad school and just continued being, having, you know, taking a responsibility for Yiddish, um, being, finding creative outlets in Yiddish, uh, finding academic ways and, and educational ways to continue um, being, engaging with Yiddish. Um, and if you're interested in learning Yiddish on your own, um, we found that actually the Duolingo app, the Yiddish um, that they teach there is actually pretty good. Um, and it is a, a contemporary Hasidic Yiddish. Um, so that's always been, um, kind of a, a divide between the Yiddish speaking world of, of um, the Hasidic community and then the sort of 
the the Yiddish that's learned in schools is has always been sort of a more um, sort of formal academic Yiddish, sort of like the difference between learning like BBC English and like, you know, speaking in a London dialect. Um, I didn't want to interrupt you in the middle of this, but I do have a question that's come up, especially when we saw the, um, the walkthrough um, of what was going on behind closed doors. Uh, we spend a lot of time, we spent time learning that um, people were studying Yiddish um, for uh, however many hours a day, and then they were doing sorting when the books were coming in. My question is, how do the people who are taking folks around the library as guests, um, how do they learn the um, uh, the important items that are part of the vocabulary of the place. I mean, this is an item that you only find three copies of. This is the first printed piece. I mean, they have to be learning that too. Where does that learning take place? Um. Well, we get fellows that come in and stay for either a year or two years. So they start every September. Um, so our amazing fellows um, that we've had for the past year are, are leaving this week. We're having a pizza lunch for them this week. We're all very sad <laughs> to see them go. This is a very sad time of year. Um, and, uh, and then the new ones, but then September comes along and the new ones start. Um, and they do a lot of training in September and October. And they're trained on the entire collection. Um, and then they're, they're trained on the tours of the building. Um, and then they sort of, by the end of the fall, they've sort of got ownership of all of that um, information and they just, they just do it. So you'll, you'll come and see, they'll be able to give you an amazing tour of the building um, and also be able to tell you exactly all of the books that are in the collection and where they came from and you know what box they opened the other day and what they sent off to various other places in the world. So. That's a tremendous amount of work, and it's and it's yeah. uh, uh, it's it was great to hear the kinds of things that they can report on. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so this is the the formal end of the presentation. Other than check, please go to our website uh, yiddishbookcenter.org, and you can find all of the um, the public programs, the archive of public programs, and um, educational events, and all kinds of things that you can. Um, engage with uh, online. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, you can always contact me if you have any questions. Um, but I'm happy to, I know we went late because of my computer issues, and I'm happy to, um, if you have to go, you know, don't let me keep you, but I'm happy to chat for as long as folks would like um, and to answer more questions. I know there was a question about our, the oldest book in our collection. So, um, it's not currently on site because it, it's been um, taken for restoration and then it's, it's stored off in our offsite collections so that it can be extra safe. But the, the mm. oldest book that we have, is kind of a mystery. We'd actually don't know its provenance. Um, mm. It just sort of showed up in the collection. You know, someone found it on a shelf one day um, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a Tanakh. So it's a, the book of the, the five books of the Torah um, in Yiddish, um, but in the oldest form of printed Yiddish, which is called Ivory Teich. Um, and it's, so it's from the 1700s, probably the 1780s, 1790s. Um, it might be a bit later than that, but it, it reuses um, a frontispiece from an even older um, volume publication set. So it's, um, it's in a tradition of, of Torah books that were um, published and and distributed all throughout Eastern Europe in the 1700s. Do you want to unmute yourself, Karen? Yes, thank you for that. That's that's fascinating to me. I have a comment and um, a question, a couple of questions actually. But the comment is, I was devastated at the name of that paper, the last extermination. That was. Wow, that's really breathtaking to name a publication that that's wow. And um, then I was wondering when they do the typewriters, like our typewriters would go 
like you would type and then it would go back. For the Yiddish, is it in opposite directions? And then the last question is, do you have cookbooks there that where they just put the ingredients, but they don't say a quarter cup, a half a cup, but it's just like, really, my mom made it like this, you know? Um, yeah, going back to the DP camps. Yeah, I mean, the, because in Yiddish, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, the word that's used for Holocaust is, is Hurben which also can be a word that refers to the destruction of the first and second temple. And wow. so it's even in secular Yiddish, you use that word, but it, 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 it already in itself refers to a history of destruction of Jewish civilizations that have then reinvented themselves. Okay. Um, so it's, I think it's, um, yeah, it's one of those words that just got a lot of context to it. That's really rich that, um, it's hard to translate, um, but it definitely refers to like sort of out of the ashes comes a new generation, I would say. Like a phoenix. Yeah, yeah, okay. a Jewish phoenix. <laughs> yeah, right. um, and your, what was your second comment? I was wondering about the typewriters. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. When we're typing and. Yeah, they, they do go the opposite way. Um, I got to type on one for the first time um, pretty recently because for our new core exhibit that's coming up, um, they're actually um, putting a bunch of typewriters um, on display in the in the repositories that people can actually type on. Um, and there'll be like prompts that people can write in Yiddish and like write little postcards and stuff. It's gonna be our most interactive um, little exhibit. Um, and so um, I got to be a, a bit of a guinea pig because the fellows had, had typed up instructions on how to use the Yiddish typewriter. Um, and so I got to sit there and, and be a test hmm. subject and be like, okay, I think, I think I can figure out how to do this. They're like, have you ever used a typewriter before? And I was like, uh, maybe once in 1985, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so yeah, so the, I never, I never had to type on a typewriter before last month. Um, but yes, now I can say that they actually do go in the other direction and um, they're really fun. And when you uh, come to the center, you should, you'll be able to try one out. Um, and your third question was about cookbooks. The yeah. only cookbooks that I've been able to look at, again, as, as Emily mentioned, they're, they're quite rare in our collection. The ones that I've used for educational purposes that are the most common are um, published by um, like, um, like Straits Matzah Factory or like Fleischmann's Margarine. Um, so they're corporate cookbooks. So they don't have that kind of personalized touch of being kind of like old world. Um, mm -hmm. So they give very precise directions. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, I think, well, you can actually check out the, um, the New York Public Library digital collection has a lot of, a lot of, they have a huge cookbook collection um, and they may have some Yiddish ones there, but there's also a, an anthropologist um, named um, Dr. Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet who was one of the main curators of the Museum of Polish Jewry in Warsaw. And she often does courses about um, like Yiddish cookbook collections because she's got like a thousand Yiddish cookbooks in her collection or something. Um, and so she often does, does courses um, where she sort of takes people into her own collection and, um, and talks about what's in those cookbooks. So there's, there's lots of Yiddish cookbooks out there that are very, that have very interesting histories to them, but because of the, the logistics of book donation, we don't have them. <laughs> and I just, one final thing, I, I'm so impressed with what you guys are doing and you should be so proud of all yeah. that work and how much you're reaching out and keeping something alive that wouldn't be except for this. So that's, that's great. It's really impressive. Thank you so much. Yeah, we really, I think everyone who works there really has that sort of spark of feeling like it's, it's something special and that we're all sort of in it, in it together. So, um, and that's why one of the reasons that we like to share and that's one of the things that that motivates me, you know, to go to work every day is, you know, being able to, to be excited about about sharing the, the work that we do. Um, and so we want to make it as accessible as possible to everyone, of course. So, um, look at our upcoming fall brochure. We're going to be doing three evening online classes. Um, one is actually on Hava Rosenfarb. That's in January. It's four Wednesday evenings in January. 
Um, and we're gonna have um, the Chava Rosenberg's uh, daughter, Goldie, um, come and do a session on what it was like um, growing up with a, with a mother who was a Yiddish writer and then talking about um, growing up and discovering Yiddish on her own, you know, for her own self and then becoming her mother's translator. Um, and so that's gonna be really, really special. Um, we're going to have a course in March that's um, all about the, the new core exhibit. And so it'll be sort of a virtual tours of the exhibit and all kinds of conversations about Yiddish modernism and Yiddish poetry and, you know, Yiddish and gender. So that's going to be great. And then our fall class, um, which is totally a new and sort of out of the box course for us, is going to be on um, Yiddish folklore rituals and customs and like magic. Um, particularly like women's magic um, and all of the ways that, you know, women's oral traditions and Yiddish were sort of left out of the canon, um, but are still um, with us today. have been passed down through the oral tradition and all of the different things we can learn um, from studying that. So that's just, you know, what I've got on the schedule for the week. But I mean, there's, there's just dozens of things um, that we have um, on our website or through our public programs or, um, you know, from our um, book clubs. So there's lots of different ways to get involved. And we always welcome, you know, questions, comments, visits, you know, we're, we're as accessible as we can be being located in <laughs> the mountains of Western Massachusetts. And uh, if you want to say goodbye in Yiddish, you can say Zeit gesund. You can say Bleibt mir gesund und stark. Stay healthy and strong. Have a good event and bis später. So we can always say bis später. We'll see you later. It's like saying a bientôt in French. Bis später. So um, I'm happy to answer any more questions, but otherwise you can always um, send your questions through through Debbie to me, or you can um, reach, uh, reach me. Let's see, teachers at yiddishbookcenter.org. Um, or Jay Young at YiddishBookCenter.org. Either of those will get to me. And um, and please do come visit us in person. I'd really love to see you there. Thank you so much for participating in this program tonight. Oh, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, and thank you so much to Jennifer Young for leading, leading such a wonderful virtual field trip. So, yay. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Have a good night. <laughs>